Welcome to the day two's proceedings of the fifth World Congress on Disaster Management. Ladies and gentlemen, we've gathered here today and we all wish you a very bright and happy morning. Once again, to remind you all to please do follow the COVID protocol as we have shared with you yesterday also. Please keep one seat empty between you. There should be no adjacent sitting. It should be alternate. And also a gentle reminder to please do remember to either switch off your cell phones or put them on silent mode. Thank you. We start with the plenary session, which is entitled Emerging Technologies and Innovation for Reducing Risks of Disasters. The session is being chaired by Professor V. Ram Gopal Rao, Director, IIT Delhi. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure in inviting the Honorable Dignitary to join us on the days. He needs no introduction to the August gathering, a beacon of light to everybody who's studying engineering here at IIT and around the world, a renowned name. It gives me great pleasure to welcome him on the stage. I request Sri Nishit Upadhyay to kindly present a bouquet to the Honorable Dignitary and please welcome him. Professor Rao is the chair for this session. Meanwhile, I take the pleasure of inviting the speakers, the esteemed speaker. We start with Dr. U. K. Singh, Director General, LS, DRDO, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Defense, is representing the Defense Ministry of the Government of India. Please put your hands together and give a warm welcome. May I request Kanu Srivastava to please present a bouquet to the Honorable Dignitary and please welcome him. Joining us virtually in this session is Professor David Frost, Elizabeth and Bill Higginbotham, Professor, School of Civil and Environmental Engineering, Georgia Institute of Technology. A very warm welcome to you, Professor David Frost, if you can hear us. A warm welcome to Dr. Shailesh Nayak, Director, National Institute of Advanced Studies and former Secretary, Ministry of Environmental Studies. And a warm welcome to Dr. Rajiv Shaw, Professor, Graduate School of Media and Governance, KO University. They're all joining us virtually. Meanwhile, I take the pleasure of inviting on stage Sri Anurag Sharma, Director Onshore, ONGC. Please put your hands together and give a warm welcome. I request Colonel Dalveer Singh to kindly present a bouquet to the Honorable Dignitary and please welcome him. Thank you, sir. So now that we have welcomed the dignitaries onto the dais and we have the chair and the speakers here, I would now hand it over to the esteemed chair to take the session forward. It's over to you, sir. Good morning and uh, welcome to the second day of the event. The session is uh, technology and innovation for building resilience to disasters. So we have five speakers, 15 minutes each. And uh, so we will, I think, without uh, you know, delaying the session any further, uh, let's start with uh, Dr. UK Singh. Dr. UK Singh is Director General, DRDO, Ministry of Defense. And I will just briefly introduce him. So Dr. Singh, uh, he assumed charge of Director CAIR Care, uh, DRDO Bangalore, with effect from June 2019. Prior to this assignment, he was director double DRDO from uh, 2015 to 2019. He was project director weapon systems for ballistic missile program, RCA DRDO Hyderabad for a couple of years. He is also the chief executive officer of the Society for Biomedical Technology started by Dr. ABJ Abdul Kalam to help the common man with development of affordable biomedical devices. And uh, Dr. Singh is a staunch supporter of indigenous and affordable healthcare development. And as CEO of this society, he has spearheaded many products such as cochlear implant, 
MEMS intracranial pressure monitor, electrocorticography sensors, external counter pulsator, and, and a few others. Dr. Singh, so you can start. Doctor UK Singh. Uh, very good morning uh, to the chairman of the session, co-speakers, and uh, my dear audience. Uh, I'm uh, speaking on behalf of Dr. G. Satish Reddy, Secretary DDRA, and, and, and chairman 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 DDRA. Uh, who could not uh, attend this session because of his important activities uh, and the meeting which was called at this point of time. I hope I'll be able to pass on his sentiments and the content which he wanted to deliver. Uh, now, you, as all this, it is it known, is known that, that... It's going, it's going. Just take slightly away. So disaster, uh, as we know, whether it is natural or, or man-made, requires immediate attention so that lives, livelihood, and livestock, including the properties, uh, can be saved, as well as conservation of development, which has already happened, uh, should also be protected. Uh, and here, I, I feel that technology and innovation is going to play a very important role, uh, as we have seen in very recent time for the pandemic COVID-19. There were a lot of requirements for the very small gadgets, which were not available in India. and. Uh, I'm going to present what DRDO did it during uh, these COVID times. Uh, but to start with, we deal with a lot of other eventualities and hazards, which particularly uh, armed forces faces in their day-to-day -day life. And basically, uh, as we know that uh, prediction of disasters or hazards are very important uh, key elements. And whether it is chemical, biological, or nuclear, or whether it is flood or earthquake or fire, all of these things, they need predictions well in time so that we know what is the extent, what is the intensity and what is the spread of these particular disasters so that management can be done more effectively. And uh, besides, besides technological uh, innovations, what is needed is alerting people uh, telling to all the all the stakeholders and dissemination of information. For that, in fact, what is needed is some kind of predictive technology using sensors. And perhaps we can also, since a lot of data is possible now to get from the environment as well as to get in the simulated environment and make a model where uh, these disaster can be predicted in time and in all kinds of terrains or the or the mountainous regions, it can be utilized very effectively uh, in all weather conditions. We know that many times disasters uh, can be known or unknown as it has happened for Corona-19, uh, COVID-19. And it's a very effective technology will be to have the simulation in place and predict the things in time. Uh, just uh, I'll give you some glimpse uh, where our uh, armed forces, they do face geo hazards, particularly in the Himalayan regions. Uh, as you must be knowing that armed forces do uh, man these particular borders and particularly a lot of death happens in the because of the snow avalanche, landslides and glacial lake uh, outburst uh, flood. 
Himalayan region is uh, full of these activities where we have to protect our soldiers. A lot of uh, activity has happened. In fact, one of the lab, DZRE, uh, works only in this direction so that they can predict, uh, simulate, and uh, save our armed forces from these hazards. The spatial extent of the problem, we must be knowing that uh, this is covering more than uh, 3,500 kilometers. And uh, particularly artificial intelligence and machine learning is being utilized for predicting uh, the, uh, the avalanche or any of the activities which is happening in this region. Uh, we must be knowing the, that there are there has there to be a safe, safe moment, moment of the from one region to other region. And for that, uh, DRDO uh, do all, all kind of help, provide all kind of helps to the troops. These are the reasons, in fact, it extends from uh, Northwest to the central to the Himalayan region, and it covers many states in the Northern region. We do also have uh, similar, similar uh, things in the uh, uh, Rajasthan area, Thar Desert, and of course, our armed forces do have the difficulties of, of getting into the underwater and, and some kind of dangerous situation do arrive where we have to uh, escape the manpower from submarines if it gets stuck. So we have built a lot of uh, underwater escape systems. The challenges, these are uh, some of the figures which will talk about, uh, which will tell about the challenges, the challenges in the, in the, in the where the soldiers have to stay uh, and we have to provide warm clothing, particularly extreme cold weather clothing, which was still getting imported till now. It's recently been made by DRDO and it is going to for the TRTO and being uh, distributed, uh, basically getting procured by the armed forces. We have vast rugged and snowbound these regions, which creates a lot of challenges to the armed forces. Affected users in these regions are multiple, uh, from Indian Army to the Border Road Organization who uh, upkeep these roads. Then we are having National Highway uh, Infrastructure Development Corporation, Power Grid, and similarly other uh, institutions who all get affected, who are responsible either for maintenance or for upkeeping of, upkeeping of, of these uh, regions. As far as mitigation is concerned, uh, there can be short-term as well as long-term mitigations where uh, artificial triggering can be done to know what are the characteristics of these particular uh, regions and from where we can have the simulation study to do the prediction for forecasting the avalanche. Uh, similarly, for the long-term, we can have the hazard mapping as well as some control structures being made in these regions so that uh, some of the uh, base camps can be saved. Avalanche and forecasting, weather forecasting, uh, multiple data can from the multiple sources can be integrated by using different algorithm, whether it is hidden Markovian model, model or, 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 or instance, and an expert system and intelligence system can be developed. In fact, uh, already many systems are developed where we are able to forecast uh, the regions, but yes, a lot of work is yet to go where we can also integrate the spectral picture from the satellites as well as we can use uh, local cool UAV, UAV where where the information fine-tuned and the model can be validated. As every country need to have the um, activities and effective CBR and defense, DRDO also do look after these chemical, biological, radiation, and nuclear uh, uh, defense program where uh, we do a lot of sensor development where uh, how to deal with these particular uh, events if it happens. And we also continuously train our armed forces utilizing live agents where even touching up of microgram can be admit dangerous uh, as it can take the life of the individual. We have developed personal as well as collective protective gears and ensembles where the front responders can wear these gears and respond to the activities. 
Similarly, there is the decontaminations and other measures which are also in place. This I'll skip. These are some of the photographs while uh, we train our armed forces. Now coming back uh, to the uh, COVID theme, time, uh, DRDO has been continuously working during the, these lockdown time. There were no holidays. There were no lockdown period for us. We did develop a lot of things. And to start with, we had thousand bed hospitals, which were set up as a MEXIF uh, hospital called Sardar Vallabhbhai Hospital, a thousand bed within record time of 12 days. And same was replicated at multiple places at 11 uh, other locations, wherever there was requirement. Though there may be a very small technology, but a lot of uh, such demand were there, particularly for sanitizer, masks, and PPE suits, which are, which are in very short supply in India. And these technologies, which were already there with DRDO, and we could repurpose it. And uh, we had transferred the technology free of cost to hundreds of industries where today we are uh, the second largest producer of PPE suits. The IDO has also developed 2DG two, two drug, which has been uh, basically uh, approved by the uh, Drug Controller General of India. And uh, it is uh, it was utilized during the second wave. There were shortages of 2DG drug, but now initially it was only Dr. Ready Lab, which was transferred the technology. Now there are more than 13 uh, industries which has taken up by paying more than 25 lakh lakh rupees, 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 rupees. And uh, uh, it is going to be available in large number in case of any eventuality. Initially, a lot of uh, PPE suits were coming from the outside and there is a test called the blood penetration resistant testing, whether the uh, PPE suits is, is capable of uh, protecting uh, individual or not. And this way being, being tested from the uh, foreign, uh, uh, this particular instrument, but then it was developed in India and it was, it is a large number were tested uh, by uh, by DRDO as well as it was in later on passed on to the industries. 2 dz drug, I have already talked. Now, another thing which we developed during this particular point of time is critical care ventilator. In fact, this was the technology long back developed by Debel, DRDO, where I was heading in long back in 2001. It was technology was transferred to a, to a firm in 2004. And uh, particularly uh, it changed hands with the three different industries because the demand in India was low. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, government has decided to proactively go for the critical care ventilator of more than 60,000, 30,000 were given to, to DRDO through Bell, it was developed. And uh, people, uh, when Bangalore was, having the maximum load of COVID patients, it was developed and uh, delivered. There are a lot of 12, minimum 12 components which are in short supply and they were not being imported. DRDO put up all their design engineers to develop these particular components and we are now started producing. Now, one of the thing is for the, particularly for the proportional walls, where the testing had to be done 100 million times. You can imagine the kind of uh, endurance test which had to be conducted to make it sure that there is no failure. And this has been done and uh, particularly through Bell. Bell also made a lot of efforts with the technology, though they were not having any, any experience earlier, but this was possible to do it. Since Debel was uh, in Bangalore, it was easy to have the technology transfer to Bell. And these are the pictures shown how the, at a time, how multiple hundreds of, uh, of uh, ventilators are being tested for the endurance test of 24 hours and the component being, uh, being made. Similarly, uh, we had also developed PSA oxygen plant, particularly it was based on the onboard oxygen generation system for the LCA uh, pages. And same technology was utilized, which was, we have, um, by utilizing which under the PM care, we have developed 931 oxygen plants and it has been, uh, it has been installed in every district, 748 districts. Some of the districts got more than one plants, but certainly outreaching to those sites, making those sites preparation and making it available. Study also, there was a review 
uh, almost 95% of those fusion plants are operational. Just, just one minute, I'll take. Yeah, these are some of the pictures, some of the difficult places we, we did carry through the Indian Air Force aircraft. We also developed oxycare system where uh, SpO2 based oxygen uh, plant, uh, oxygen uh, source were done, where 150,000 is being supplied. Uh, similarly, in the disaster, we one of the lab in, in Mysore, it has given a lot of food support, particularly a specialized food uh, to the victims. Similarly, uh, in the fire region, I'll come to the last one. Uh, this is one of the things which perhaps if as a community or as a humanity, if you have to move, we have to make network of intercommunity in a country and across the nation. We do have to have the development which can, should be sustainable. Safety net for the critical infrastructure is very important. In fact, uh, communication and network and we see did save us, all of us, though physically we could not move, but it has helped a lot in keeping us connected. Similarly, strategic or stockpiling of some of the medicines and sharing the know-how of technology across the nations if you want the humanity to survive. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Singh, for that for the talk. And uh, in fact, during the COVID time, what uh, DRDO has done for the country is quite priceworthy. In fact, in being in Delhi, I know how you could build those hospitals, which were very much needed. Thank you very much. I think we can have a discussion on some of these talks, maybe towards the end. So we'll now go to the second talk, uh, Professor David Frost. Uh, I hope uh, Professor Frost is able to hear us. Uh, Professor yes, Frost, you're able you. to hear us, see us? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, I can see you. We are not able to hear you. I yes, should be able to hear me now. Oh, now we can hear you. That's great. Huh? So I will give you a brief introduction uh, for Dr. Frost. Dr. Frost is the Elizabeth and Bill Higginbotham Professor of Civil Engineering prior to serving as a member of the faculty at Purdue University and currently uh, Georgia, Technology, Georgia Tech. He worked in industry in Ireland and Canada on a, on a range of natural resource related projects ranging from tailings, impoundments to artificial sand islands in the Arctic for oil exploration at Georgia Tech, where he has been for almost 20 years. He has served as head of Geosystems Engineering Group and as founding director of the Georgia Tech Regional Engineering Program and subsequently the Georgia Tech Savannah campus. And uh, Professor Frost's uh, core focus in his career has been the study and analysis of natural and man-made disasters. So Professor Frost, you have 15 minutes, so you can start now. Okay, I don't think you're seeing my correct screen, so let me change. Just one second. Thank you. All right, I think you should be able to see my screen now. Can you? So, yes, we are able to see and everything okay. is fine. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, let me thank the organizers for inviting me to, um, to join you this morning. And I can truly now say this morning because it's seven minutes past midnight on the 25th for me, so I'm happy to join you. Um, the title of my talk this morning, I'm going to talk a bit about post-disaster data. And it, obviously you all know very well that we're, real, we're living in a, in, a, in a time when there is an explosion in perhaps many of the, the manner in which we can both collect data and then in which we can process data and learn things out of it. And that being said, uh, I think it's very important that we don't just think of data as a bucket that we throw everything into, but that we recognize and appreciate that there are a lot of nuances involved in the data 
that we both acquire and how we, we should use it. Um, so I'm going to just have a few slides that sort of quickly summarize a few things, and I'm happy to make my presentation available to the organizers so they can distribute it as needed. But for example, purpose of post-disaster data, there are really many, many fact reasons why we might be doing that. It could be to facilitate rescue and recovery, maybe understanding what happened. We certainly could be planning for reconstruction. Uh, I think that there's an important intersection between disasters and research that can be catalyzed by it. And obviously, ultimately, we'd like to improve, improve future resilience. And indeed, there are probably some others. Um, in terms of data types, uh, I like to think of it that there are a variety of data types. One that is particularly important from my perspective is what I call perishable data. In other words, that's data that, unless it's collected quite rapidly after an event, may well be changed or may be lost. And some of that data is perhaps the most critical in trying to understand what happened. Uh, the next type is what I call non-perishable. And non-perishable data can be even sort of further divided down into what I would call static. In other words, it's not changing with time, or perhaps there are, there are time variant versions of non-perishable data. And so we may be trying to collect, get that. An important category of data in post-disaster, uh, from my perspective, is what I call change detection. In other words, we have a baseline of data and then we have a, a data at some time after an event and we can look at how things have changed. In fact, the image on the right-hand side is data that was collected by uh, some of the researchers there at IIT Delhi fo fo <coughs> following the uh, disaster in Uttarakhand um, last year. Um, and you can see from, from the color here, the, the areas in red are where the elevations are lower and the areas in blue are where the elevations is higher. And this is particularly this particular uh, data has come from the Rishiganga area. And finally, uh, in terms of, of types of data, there's a huge tendency at times for people to think that if you collect data, things are either damaged or non-damaged. But a very important category that I think is often overlooked is the what I would call the not observed. And if we don't deliberately collect or at least in record where we haven't collected data, then there's a tendency to either put things into one of the other two boxes or the other two categories, and we get very distorted insights into what's happening. In terms of data collection methods, we're very rich. Uh, we have human, we have robot now, we have mobile. By that, I'm talking about for example, let's say street view, you know, on, on a car or something. Uh, we have air, airborne, um, and, and while originally we were probably limited to fixed wing uh, or rotary aircraft, obviously there's a proliferation of UAV technologies now. We have satellite, we have embedded sensors. And another category of data that we have is what I would call social media or citizen science data. Um, one of the things in, in the context of our data collection methods is that um, we don't often do a great job of planning our data collection uh, route, and therefore we tend to be quite random and, and, to be honest, not optimizing how we're doing the data collection. Uh, data scales clearly come into the picture, and uh, those are either spatial scales or temporal scales as well. Uh, and one of the distinctions that I like to make when I'm talking about spatial scales is not just um, the, the extent of the area, but separating out what I would call an impacted area from an affected area. And the affected area, for example, in the case of a landslide here, uh, the, the impacted area might be the area where the actual uh, volume of material is released from, 
whereas the affected area is the area where that, that same volume of material gets distributed. And, and, and in many cases, that affected area is much larger. Similarly, the other important scale when we're looking at our data is obviously time scales. And there are multiple time scales that we may need to look at data. Um, in terms of data processing, uh, this, is, this is somewhere where I, I honestly think we've got to come back now and use some of our data processing tools to do a better job. Uh, because we have different needs and capabilities associated with this. For example, uh, everybody would love to have real-time data. Um, if not, the next best thing might be what we call near real-time. And then there are other data sets that uh, we, we, we can't get access to until the long term. Um, a lot of these, um, uh, the, the, the availability uh, of the data of different types comes from not only the retrieval process, but also the processing requirements. And I'm showing two images on the right here. The first is actually data that I personally collected 20 years ago now after the Bouge earthquake. And you can see that I had a camera, uh, I had a spreadsheet, and, and I had uh, a relatively simple GIS tool. And I could literally, by the end of the day, in my hotel, pull up all of the information that I had collected that day and at least be able to review it and do some simple querying on it. In the lower image, that is not actually a picture or photograph, but rather it is a UAV structure from motion model that was developed um, after uh, an earthquake in northern Japan. But you can see the incredible fidelity that we can get with data that. The drawback is it takes probably a month post field work to be able to generate that type of uh, imagery. Data quality is something that um, I also think we need to be more deliberate in how we deal with it. Uh, it it's easy to quantify it as either low fidelity, uh, maybe even qualitative, moderate fidelity, high fidelity, uh, you know, all of those subdivisions or categories are dictated in, in large part by the metadata that accompanies the data. In other words, data about the data. The other thing that I wanted to point out about data quality is, you know, for example, some people may sit, consider that social media data is a lower quality. However, it takes relatively little calibration or validation for example, by an expert going to a location and confirming some observations or, or directly measuring some, some observations to convert what might otherwise be considered a, a large volume of low quality data into something more useful. Uh, the, another attribute of our data is the specificity or, or, or I like to think about it also as a scale. Um, for example, uh, we may be capturing literally features or what I would call point data. Uh, in some cases, we're interested in network. For example, uh, a highway, which is consisting of, of segments of, of, of road, bridges, and tunnels, and other features. And so uh, the, the, the functionality of that network is a function of a, diff a whole series of different types of components. We may be dealing with sub-regional type of, of areas, and the image in the lower right, for example, is from the World Trade Center site in New York, where uh, you can see that based on, on preliminary reconnaissance, we were able to identify buildings that were, were critically damaged versus those, those that had lesser degrees of damage. And obviously, we sometimes we're even interested in what I call regional or large scale. In other words, we may be looking at areas of several hundred uh, kilometers on square. Finally, there's another data type that I think we also should pay attention to, and that's what I would call surrogate data. And and in, and, and I'll talk more about that in a second. One of the important things that I think represents where we have still some opportunity to improve is if we start to plot our data that we have um, on a timeline and, um, sorry, uh, 
for example, th these are different types. I apologize, this is a small font. But this is the time evolution of data sets after a hurricane in Puerto Rico. And here was the day of the event. Here's one day, one week, one month. And you can see that, that while we have some data within a day or a week, large portions of the data are not available to us until at least a month out. Similarly, this is uh, for a different event, an earthquake um, in, in Indios, Puerto Rico, um, uh, about two years after the hurricane. And, and again, we have the same trend where uh, there's some day that data that's available almost immediately, but there's other data that at best we don't have access to it for a week and some of it's even longer. And so some of this data here, in fact, maybe some of the best data, but we don't actually finish the processing of it until it's almost too late to be useful for things that we, we might want it to do. Uh, obviously, the ideal scenario is to have all of the data that we acquired rapidly, um, but, but, but that's just not going to be feasible, at least in the short term. So we need to think about how do we, how do we perhaps uh, improve our data collection activities. Um, I mentioned surrogate, and this is an example of surrogate data. This, this is not, for example, a measure of um, uh, collapsed buildings or anything like that. But what it is, is night lights, and this was taken uh, before Hurricane Maria. This is Puerto Rico. So you can see here, here is the, uh, the capital city, um, uh, San Juan. And this is a satellite image of night lights taken after Hurricane Maria. And by doing change detection between night lights, we're immediately able to discern, to discern where uh, there's clearly been um, a loss of electricity and so on. So while this is not a direct technical site, it's, it's a very valuable site that literally can be gathered within uh, the, the, the first few hours of an event and, and help us understand where there may be issues. Um, so how do we best use the data? I've sort of talked about it in a variety of manners. So I think the first step is, is to identify the purpose. Uh, and, and is our purpose a short-term need, intermediate term, or a long-term need? I think we need to separate data collection from data processing because um, there are some data that we can collect very rapidly, but the time it takes to process it is quite long. And a lot of times, I'm not saying we don't collect the data, but instead of, for example, trying to process all of the data, if we, if we decimate the data and only process every 10th data point or every 100th data point, we still have high fidelity data that may be suitable for our purposes, but we can shorten the processing time down from weeks to literally a day or, or something like that. So in other words, I'm saying process only what you need to accomplish the goals at a given time, and then we can expand the processing later. Somehow we have the, 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 the approach at times, I think, that we need to do everything at once. And, and that, that's part of our downfall. Uh, so in summary, if I sort of start to look at um, uh, responding to extreme events, and I look at it in terms of reward going from low to high, or risk going from high to low, I think for a large part of the time, we sort of existed down in this area. And to be honest, we, we were almost unaware of the, 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 the types of problems that we even had. As we began to study more, we moved from an unaware posture to what I would call a reactive posture. In other words, as soon as the event occurred, we headed out and we did something. So we were reacting to the event. Uh, I think with data, we not only have an opportunity to become proactive, in other words, where we try and, and, and prepare better for events that will inevitably occur, but most importantly, if we can get ourselves and use our data to bring ourselves to this position that I call predictive, then I think we can not only uh, be ready for the events, but we can actually dramatically reduce the losses and so on from the event. 
And so I've got here a set of summary comments. They um, you know we're not lacking for information act uh, acquisition tools. We should not be enamored by quantity of data. We, we need to focus on the quality too. Um, we, we um, you know, I, I often ask people, how ready are you to discard bad information that you got for free or maybe you even paid to acquire? Somehow, when we invest in a bit of data, we're very hesitant to throw it out. But the bottom line is, is it, can be, it can be rotting the quality of our larger data set. So we really need to focus on data quality. Um, how much data do we need and will we really use? Um, definitely, we need to not lose sight of the technical purpose. You know, a lot of these data technologies now, it's very easy to get enamored by the data that it's giving you. But if you can't properly ingest it and process it, then it's probably not helping you. Clearly, GIS-based tools offer amazing opportunities for data integration. And, and uh, in, you know, on top of that, soft computing methods like uh, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, those are really still, in my opinion, underutilized in, uh, in post-hazard analysis, but they are huge opportunities to uh, process our data. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Um, I, I would point out that thoughtful use of data can move us from a reactive approach to a predictive one in disaster. And this particular image here showing how this uh, equipment is trying to reopen a road here may be a great example of a reactive response rather than a proactive one. And we're actually causing additional hazard particularly for the operator of this equipment, uh, if we're trying to remove this uh, debris from a landslide. Uh, so with that, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Frost, for that excellent lecture. Thank you. And also sorry for keeping you awake so late. <laughs> so, uh, Not at all. In the interest of time, we will go to the third speaker now. So we have uh, Dr. Shailesh Naik, uh, Director, National Institute of Advanced Studies and former Secretary, Ministry of Earth Sciences. Are you able to hear us, uh, Dr. Naik? Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can. That's good. Good to know that. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Naik is currently Director NIAS. He was a he was distinguished scientist during 2015 to 18 and Secretary, Ministry of Earth Sciences, Government of India during August 2008 to 15. He has been credited with launching many research programs related to monsoon, AC interaction, changing water cycle, atmospheric chemistry, and various others. In fact, uh, uh, we had, uh, Dr. Nayak had set up uh, the state-of-the-art uh, tsunami warning system for the Indian Ocean in uh, 2007 in a record uh, two years' time, providing tsunami advisories to the Indian Ocean Rim countries. He is a fellow of uh, various academies and all that. Dr. Naik, you have 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rampal Rao. I'm extremely grateful to you and Professor Ramana to provide me an opportunity to discuss uh, some of the issues about the natural hazards. If you see, today we are facing two major challenges. Uh, one with the natural hazards and another is the possible impact of the climate change. Now, most places on the earth are vulnerable to one or other hazards, such as floods, droughts, earthquakes, cyclones, storms, tsunami, landslide, etc. We must live with these hazards and prepare ourselves to respond to hazards to save lives. Now, natural hazards are essentially represent the extreme fluctuation in the average dynamic state of the earth system. The effective response to such an event depends on the quality of scientific knowledge about a particular hazard, expertise of the organizations who are responsible for responding to extreme events, and hazard consciousness of the communities involved. The extreme or hazardous events interacting with the vulnerable human and natural systems can lead to disasters, especially in absence of a responsive social system. Hence, 
the building of effective resilience to natural hazards needs to be addressed at the three levels of the systems, global or earth system, social system, comprising infrastructure, governance structure, industrial capability, and human system or people. Infusion of a state-of-art technology and the development of innovative techniques are required to improve the each level of the systems. The knowledge about the earth system is critical to build effective mechanism for an accurate detection and monitoring of hazard, early forecast and setting up of warning services and constant assessment of hazard and to assess the vulnerability of people. The basic knowledge elements include physics of hazard generation, their space-time history and the details of earth processes. Global observations, including satellite and aerial observations of atmosphere, ocean, land surface, cryosphere, processed in real time, are required for the hazard prediction models. Satellites provide capability to observe Earth system at a very temporal, spectral, and spatial resolutions. GIS, having capability to acquire data from many observing platforms, Organize into a database, analyze and model, visualizing various hazard processes, as well as conveying the advisories through web and location based services is an extremely powerful tool. It was also mentioned by Professor David Frost. There is an all round development in the forecasting of hazards during the last two decades. Due to augmentation in the observing systems, and computing capability, understanding of physics, modeling, and then forecasting. However, we are yet to develop resilience to all kinds of hazards. I will give you a few quick examples. A cyclone is one of the major hazards that threaten human lives and livestock. The forecast of cyclone has been now quite reliable as witnessed during the last decade, and many lives have been saved. The high resolution vertical profile of atmospheric winds, temperature and the humidity, as well as the observations of the atmospheric thermodynamic structure will further improve our understanding of cyclone processes and provide insight into intensification and decay of cyclones. The use of AI based tools will help to analyze data from the observation data along with the data which we get from the social media. The 2004 tsunami has affected practically all countries in Southeast and South Asia, and lakhs of people died due to absence of any warning system. The state of our tsunami warning system set up in October 2007 is a classic case of a decision support system. The system has provided very useful advisories during the last nine years to all countries in the Indian Ocean region without any false alarm. I can mention that the first advisory goes without any human interventions. It's completely automated system. The magnitude of great earthquakes uh, is generally underestimated in the swan time, which leads to a tsunami like what happened in Japan. A network of GPS and accelerometer can provide size of rupture and we can link it to the magnitude of mega earthquake to overcome this problem. There is also need to constantly carry out research related to understanding of the earthquake and tsunami generation processes and upgrade the system, especially for the near field tsunami. The floods are very common hazard being faced every year due to extreme rainfall events. Floods affect population, environment, and economy. Last several years, urban flooding has become a serious issue in all metro cities. An expert system for forecasting urban floods by integrating outputs of models of regional weather, tide, overland flow, and strong water drainage has been developed for Chennai and Mumbai. And recently, the last November, this system provided very useful input 
about the inundation levels at the ward level. There is also we require to uh, develop systems for the mountain areas and especially there the major lacuna is information about the snowfall and its accumulation which is not available which would be very critical critical to develop the forecast models. Also for the glacial lake outward floods we need a routine monitoring of the glacial floods and then we can develop probabilistic forecasts in terms of time and magnitude. Last 10 years or so, earthquakes have been a major cause of the disasters. The increasing population affects the existing habitats and rational land use or limit the use of knowledge about earthquake in siting, design of buildings and landmines. We need a very efficient monitoring of earthquake parameters and disseminating this information to all stakeholders. And currently in India, this system has been extremely efficient, which provides this information within the minutes of earthquake which happened. During the Sikkim earthquake, the information about the earthquake, its location, magnitude, and the depth, and likely affected areas were provided within 10 minutes to all concerned. Such information certainly helped the government both at the central and the state government to initiate early relief and the rescue operations. Second, as we have not been able to predict the earthquakes, we need to assess our vulnerability to such an event. The seismic microzonation, which is a process of classifying a region into zones of relatively similar exposure to various earthquake related effects, has emerged as a major tool towards providing site-specific hazard and risk-related products to enable appropriate planning of pre- and post-disaster management strategies. Such maps are available, but however, they have to be integrated with the urban planning maps to take effective measures. Third, which we need to do is the, uh, develop a relationship between the earthquake precursors and earth generation processes, a systematic research plan for our generation of a long-term comprehensive multi-parametric geophysical observations in seismically active areas are required, which has been now initiated. This will help to establish a relationship between various earthquake precursors and earthquake processes and improve our understanding of the earthquakes. Landslide is an area which has not received sufficient attention. Almost 12% of Indian landmass is vulnerable to landslides. And most landslides are occurring in remote mountainous areas, which are also prone to heavy rainfall and earthquakes. Since they are associated with other hazards, and many times the damage caused as well as life loss are not accounted for the landslides. Also, the individual events affect locally, unlike the other hazards like cyclone, tsunami, or earthquakes. The identification of landslide prone areas has been accomplished, but we yet to build a forecasting capability, especially landslide associated with rainfall. Recently, an experiment has been done to forecast landslide in Milgiris using the forecasted rainfall with reasonable success. I think such experiment has to continue. Also the experiment with the wireless sensors to measure the soil moisture is being carried out to build such capability to forecast. It is necessary that we address this issue in a much more organized manner. The building of capacity to forecast and early warning is not sufficient to mitigate risk from the hazards. The existing social systems, political, administrative, economic, and industrial structures are equally important to provide resilience to the society. It is seen that though hazard-related information has been provided, 
in absence of effective communication to people at large or late lack of ability of local administration to respond to an event still causes loss of lives and damage to property. The setting up of national disaster management authorities at state and central levels and National Disaster Response Force India has tremendously improved the response mechanism. The development of the information system and the emergency plans for all types of hazards for evacuation, rescue and relief will help to set up very effective and efficient response mechanism in the country. It has been now realized that even if we have early warning system and responsive organization to address any event, without supportive human system, we still lose lives. In India, over a period of time, especially on the East Coast, the trust of local communities in the forecast, as well as in local administration has increased to many fold. They are now reasonably well educated about the possible dangers from cyclones and tsunami. It is desirable to educate people, especially students, about science, social impact, and rescue measures. It has been observed that many villages have volunteers to inform people about potential dangers as well as to assist administration in directing people to safe places and providing necessary relief. After the event, they also provide evidence of damage and assist in providing compensation to affected people. Such citizen-centric initiative can be immensely beneficial for recovery programs. Such people have to be equipped with a few tools such as smartphones and trained to carry out their functions. In the end, I would say three important aspects which we need to consider. We also need to consider how the anthropogenic activities have influenced the hazard processes in generating the extreme events. A changing climate leads to change in the frequency, intensity, and the spatial extent, duration, and timing of extreme weather and climate events. We need to produce special climate products to monitor such events. Second, an effective collaboration with the neighboring countries to build the observational systems, develop standards for data exchange, networking of required services, and to prepare human communities as to be ensured. There is a need to enhance our capability for responding to hazards at the regional, national, institutional, and individual level. And lastly, the communication with the information box all stakeholders is very critical. The effective communication with the local administrators, media, as well as people as the very vital. And lastly, an education system that produces scientists and managers are needed to implement a well-developed resilient plan is very critical. We need to enhance our capability for education at a regional, institutional and individual level. And this session is being, being held in IIT, I'm sure they would be looking at the kind of education which we need to provide for resilient, resilience for the society from the various disasters. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mike, for that interesting lecture. In fact, uh, I see a huge role for even the electrical engineers, the IoT related systems for some of these, I think the sensing platforms, a lot of things can be done as a multidisciplinary kind of an effort. Thank you very much, Dr. Mike. So we'll now go on to the next speaker, uh, Professor Rajiv Shah. Professor Shah, are you able to hear us? Uh, is everything fine? No? Video? Oh, yes, sent a video report, I see. It's not a live talk, I see. Well, professor Shah is the Professor of Graduate School of Media and Governance in Kiyo University, Shonan Fujisawa Campus. He is a Japanese national of Indian origin. 
Professor Shah has also served as the Executive Director of the Integrated Research on Disaster Risk, a decade-long research program co-sponsored by the Indian Council for Science, the International Social Science Council, and the United Nations International Strategy and Disaster Reduction. Previously, he served as a professor in the Graduate School of Global Environmental Studies in Kyoto University. His expertise includes community-based disaster risk management, climate change adaptation, urban risk management, and disaster and environmental education. So we'll have Professor Shah's lecture now. Uh, thank you. A very good morning to all of you. My name is Rajiv Shah, uh, and I'll be I'll be speaking on the science, technology, and innovation in disaster risk reduction, mostly on the Asia Pacific perspective. Um, I'm a professor in Keio University with some other um, hats, like co-chair of the United Nations Asia Pacific Science Technology Advisory Group, CLA for the IPCC Six Assessment Report, and so on. I actually uh, try to summarize some of the advancement of science, technology, and academia for 30 years from 1990 to 2020 in this particular paper. This is in the Journal of Disaster Risk Science. It, it was published last year, in 2020. If you have a chance uh, or if you just Google it, you will be able to possibly uh, try to download this one. And most of my work also can be found in uh, my website, rajibshaw.org. Um, you know that uh, in 2015, we had three major um, global framework, um, uh, the uh, SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, and the framework and Paris Agreement. We tried to look at some of the commonalities and found that each of the framework has a very strong commonality with each other and it has cross-reference also. But one interesting thing came that we try to see that the use of the term called local it has been used 10 times in SDG, 48 times in Sendai, nine times in Paris Agreement, which talks like, and how it is used like local authorities, communities, culture, local government, knowledge, priorities, and so on. So it talks about that um, although, although it is, uh, uh, we understand the local, the, the global policies and so on, uh, but I think the local uh, implementation becomes very, very important. So, and this has been recognized by most of the, uh, most of the global uh, framework. The World Economic Forum's Global Risk Outlook, many of you are aware about this. Every year it comes and um, the green color is the environmental risk, blue uh, the economic and so on. If you see that, uh, that there are two um, uh, sets of uh, two sets of um, uh, picture here. The upper one is in terms of likelihood, and the lower one in terms of impact. And if you see that the green boxes are increasing, uh, and uh, likelihood of the environmental risk, whether it is extreme weather, whether it is the natural hazards or disasters, whether it is climate action or inaction, these are becoming very high uh, in terms of uh, likelihood as well as in terms of impact. If you see last year, uh, like this year report, which was um, the summary of the last year, of course, the infectious disease, the global pandemic becomes number one in terms of impact. But still, in spite of all the global pandemic, when it talks about the likelihood, it is extreme weather, climate action, and the human environmental uh, degradation um, or damage um, is becomes very, very high. So we need to, what does it say that, uh, yes, we need to think about the environmental risk, the disaster um, related risk, and of course the new risk, the infectious disease and so on together. There are two major risks which are coming and which also needs attention on the right hand side is the digital power concentration and the digital inequality. So the world is becoming more digitally divided and how we actually uh, address that is very, very important. So it keeping, so the point here is that the risk landscape is changing over time. 
So we're keeping that in mind. So there are um, a few policy gaps I would like to um, point out here. One is, uh, this is an analysis which we do in the in different Asian countries uh, on the role of science technology, the status of science and technology uh, in three specific aspects. One is science in the decision-making, and the one is the investment and then the link of science technology to the people. This is a qualitative assessment made by an expert group in each of the countries with a scale from one to five, five the highest, one the lowest. So this is the comparative analysis between Indonesia and Japan. If you look at this in more details, uh, these are 11 countries. India is also there. This is the accu accumulative scale uh, or the score. Uh, China tops this with the science technology in the, with the score of 78, followed by Japan uh, and uh, Indonesia. Uh, but the interesting part was that although China has the very high uh, science technology in the decision making score, the investment in science technology was very high, but link of science technology to people part becomes quite low. But if you see the Indonesia one, 68, 77, 69, which is quite balanced. For India, I will say again, quite balanced that uh, 70, 53, 57. Like the investment in science technology in India, especially for disaster risk reduction, possibly need to be increased. Again, these are not my assessment. It's a group of uh, experts in each country who made this particular assessment. Uh, we facilitated this from as a, as a group of the Asia Pacific Science Technology Advisory Group. On the research gaps, there are a few research gaps. We also did some work with Elsevier, tried to find out all the Scopus Journal articles over the last five years or so. And we found that, um, the, of course, again, China tops uh, in five years um, the number of research articles on disaster. China followed by US, Japan. Obviously for natural reasons, it has large number of scientists possibly, so it comes very high. But when it comes to the impact, what you see on the upper scale of the y-axis, I think some of the European countries also have more higher impact. India has little higher impact here, uh, even higher impact than uh, Japan, although the number is low. Uh, one of the main reason is that in Japan, lots of research is more on the basic science, like the mechanism of the hazard, the engineering aspects of the hazard. But when it comes to the uh, policy relevance research, I think uh, India has a little bit higher uh, policy relevance research than Japan. And that's why it is in the higher scale. But one important issue is that we found that this death toll versus economic losses. Uh, the publications where the death toll high, uh, the, the countries actually where the death toll is high, the publication is not that high. Uh, but the economic losses, um, like the publications are higher where the economic losses are high. So it shows that uh, we have this still the north-south divide of the research, uh, DRR research, uh, where we really need um, more research to save people's life. Possibly we are not doing that one and breaking this boundary is quite critical. Another very important part I would like to highlight here is the digital divide and inclusiveness. This is an example from Japan and prefecture called Kochi prefecture, which has, high, which has lowest digital media penetration has a very high aged population, very high seismic and tsunami risk and the flood risk. So there is a major digital divide and inclusiveness, whether it is the infrastructure, policy, urban, rural, age, gender, and so on. So what I'm trying to point out that this is our new challenge for the science technology group that uh, of course, uh, it's not only just the invention of the new technology, but how we bring the technology or how we make the technology accessible to all different groups of people breaking this digital divide. I think that's a major challenge we are facing in the science technology, especially for the disaster risk reduction. A few milestones. So in the science technology advisory group of the United Nations, um, which I chaired, the upper part is the global one. Uh, we have the Sendai and then we had global platform. Many of you are participating in that. The lower one are the regional meetings, which we do in the Asia Pacific. 
And here, uh, you know that there are the ministerial conference uh, this November 2016, it was hosted uh, by India in Delhi. So before that, we had um, the science technology conference, which was hosted by Thailand. And we tried to bring the science technology perspective and then give the inputs to the ministerial conference. Similarly, uh, for 2018 Mongolia, we had the science technology conference in China. Uh, the APMC DRR in the Australia one is still yet to be done. It, it will be next year, but we had already uh, our science technology conference in Malaysia and we'll be having our next one uh, in Philippines next year. So this is again, we try to gather different types of uh, science voices, try to see what are the different gaps and make this type of publication. And again, when I say science technology, it's not just the scientist only conference. Whoever uses science, be it local government, national government, UN, non-government organizations or NGOs, private sector, media. So we actually encourage all different stakeholders, whoever uses science and technology to participate and contribute in this type of compilation. So there are many different types of already usage of science and technology, and we try to document that and try to, try to uh, disseminate uh, that part. I will give you two examples, classic example of science technology in more uh, formalized way. And uh, one is NADMA in Malaysia. So there is a science uh, expert panel on DRR. And this is important that uh, this particular science expert panel provides direct inputs to the National Disaster Management Authority of Malaysia. But the science expert panel comes from government, university, NGOs, and private sector. So this is a multidisciplinary science technology expert panel. So that's a very, very important part of that. The another example from Philippines is they have the Resi Resilience Council, National Resilience Council, which are co-chaired by private sector and the government, co-chaired by the Minister uh, of uh, Defense, like it's called the Secretary of Civil Defense, and the head of um, a major conglomerate um, called SM. But the presidency is with the science and technology. So it's a very interesting collaboration with private sector, government, science and technology, and they work directly with the local government unit, where you see this LGU and that makes a lot of impacts. There are many different aspects of science and technology. The citizen science is becoming again uh, quite popular, but still possibly underexplored. Um, we did this work in Baranashi in India, tried to, with, with uh, Fujitsu, a Japanese company, and tried to see that an AR-based, uh, augmented reality-based uh, citizen science uh, for the technological intervention for the inundation flooding. And like you take the photo of the, of the vehicle, like the tire of the vehicle, how much it is inundated, and that actually automatically calculates the height of the inundation or the depth of the inundation. And then you have a color coding 30 centimeter, or sorry, 30 millimeter or 50 or 60 like that. And then uh, accordingly, it is plotted in the, in the in the map so uh, and that actually helps you in the navigating the during the like the especially the traffic navigation during the uh, flooding timing so citizen science has a very strong role to play Nowadays, we also see lots of science research, science technology research on the private sector. I work very closely with this company called Water. Uh, this is an AI-based uh, water recycling where you don't need a water supply, but you can use it for the hand wash, especially during Corona, it has become very popular in Japan. Also, Teiji and another company, they put also heat resistant paint. Um, and this is again, very useful for the public building, like the schools and so on. It can reduce the heat by 30 to 15 degree if you have this paint on the roof or the on the on the wall and it is again commonly used in japan also in some of the schools uh, on some of the buses like that so we can actually use it for the school buses uh, in india and some other um, uh, hot uh, countries this is a new thing which we are trying to understand the science based entrepreneurship and one of the my very like it's my passion also that how we um, encourage the youth and the 
uh, young professionals to come out, not only just for job seeking, but to develop their own job and try to have their incubation mindset. We also developed um, this small um, daily based startup called Resilience Innovation Knowledge Academy, uh, Rika, uh, rikaindia.com. And this particular um, science technology and the private sector uh, linkage, I think we are trying to develop different in incubation uh, or the incubator center, uh, which actually try to bring this private sector, bring more um, closer to the policy through research, innovation and knowledge. We are working with some of the universities in India uh, and try to see that what are the uh, different types of incubators role and uh, different uh, social innovation, and, uh, and uh, another important point is the transdisciplinary, like we need different types of discipline. So with that, I don't go for any conclusion of my talk. I just leave with some of the keywords which I talked here. And I hope that uh, it gave you a little bit of idea about uh, the key issues of science and technology, especially in this, in this particular region. So thank you very much. Once again, I apologize that I have not been able to participate face to face. And I'm sending, sending this particular video in assumption that if I'm not able to join online. Thank you very much. Namaskar. And our next speaker is Mr. Anurag Sharma, Director Anshur, ONGC. He was appointed as the Director Anshur of India's flagship ONGC in June 2020. He has 37 years of experience in upstream and oil gas sector. After graduating from MNIT Allahabad at an MBA from FMS and then did you know, executive education from IIM Calcutta. As a director onshore, he is responsible for managing nine onshore oil and gas assets and one CBM asset. In addition, he is holding the responsibility of Director OMPL, the HSCZ, MSCZ, and Director in charge of Joint Venture Operations Group. And he's a Director in charge of HSC ONGC. So welcome. And probably he needs help right, for videos, sir. That's okay. Thank you. Good morning, uh, respected chair and my fellow panelists. The topic for my discussion is how to manage disasters in the ENP sector. So let me start how uh, the petroleum sector in the country came into being. Uh, although oil discovery was made in the 18th century in Assam, but the petroleum sector really grew uh, with the ONGC coming into being in 1956. The first well which was taken up by ONGC was Jawalamukhi in Jammu. And subsequent wells also proved successful, Lonage 1 in Kembe. But the first commercial discovery was on Kleshwar 1 in 1960, which is still producing. So this is how the petroleum sector came into being in the country with the advent of ONGC. Now over the years, um, soon, uh, uh, soon after the discovery of uh, on Kleshwar field in 1960, more discoveries were found in Assam, Gujarat, and uh, giant oil field uh, Mumbai offshore was discovered in 1974. So that's, so how, that's how ONGC, ONGC came into came being, being and, and, and uh, several installations were put into place. As of now, we have an impressive resource space. So we have 290 offshore installations, uh, which include 14 process complexes, 246 wallet platforms. We have two FPSOs as well, three plants for processing of oil and gas. And in onshore, we have 265 installations, a pipeline network of about 30,000 kilometers. We have a, our own OSVs, MSVs, own stimulation vessel, 
seismic crews, we operate about 100 drilling rigs and about 85 workover rigs, about 90 odd logging units as well as stimulation units. So all, all these installations are potential hazards and we need to maintain them well. Uh, this is just to give an idea of the geographical spread. Uh, we have presence in the west as well as east, western offshore, where the Mumbai High, uh, Basin Satellite, Neelam Hira main assets are uh, situated. And in western onshore, we have uh, oil fields in Gujarat. Then in Rajasthan, we have a uh, work center in Jodhpur, where gas discovery has taken place. In south, uh, we have bases in Rajamundri and Kaveri. And in Northeast, uh, we have presence in Assam, Jorhat, Agartala and Silchar. So coming to the uh, topic for today's discussion, the risks in ENP industry. So these, uh, there are so many risks, but to summarize the major risks and hazards can be called in the form of blowouts, explosion fires, toxic gas releases, oil spills, logistics helicopter crashes pipelines pipelines carrying oil and gas they get ruptured there are accidents in offshore there are accidents in onshore transportation accidents so all these uh, incidents uh, can take place into major hazards if not if timely action is not taken so this is uh, another snapshot of accidents in the oil and gas sector which has taken place over the over years, the years. The Piper Alpha incident in particular, 1988, which uh, uh, offshore platform incident in North Sea, uh, in which more than 160 people lost their lives. So all these incidents are reviewed in the oil industry tree and they became, became part of the part course, of the course study, study and we keep on improving our safety systems. So how do we manage safety in an oil industry. So process safety management is usually the answer which most of the companies and in oil industry uh, resort to. So process safety management has the following components. The first one is starting from the design stage. So starting from design, if we design it right and with a with desired safe operating envelopes, which includes uh, uh, that we do hazard studies, uh, we follow all the API and SOLAS protocols. So this is the first step. If we design it right, so we are in a position to minimize any incidents. The next step is operating right. We have safety operating practices for each and every procedure. We have to carry out uh, mock drills to ensure that all those practices are in place. And then to maintain, for maintenance, we carry out uh, various inspections, audits, to ensure that all these uh, safety practices are in place. So to ensure that safety uh, tools are in place, we need people who are well-trained to manage the facilities, who are competent, who are motivated, and they have to keep on updating their knowledge. And altogether, it requires a robust HSC management system. For example, ONGC uh, follows a very robust HSC management system, which is compliant to uh, latest ISO standards 9001, 14001, and 40, 45001. So all together, this creates an asset integrity, which is uh, a robust model to face any incidents. Uh, this is a typical uh, bow tie concept, which again, we use in oil industry. On the left-hand side, if you see uh, the hazards and on the right hand side are the consequences. So if the hazards are not taken care of, this may result of in a top event and its outcome will lead to many consequences. So what we do is we try to visualize all the possible threats and we try to create several barriers so that the top event does not take place. And in the event, top event takes place, what can be done so that outcome is not outcome is minimized, we create more safeguards. So this is, uh, uh, this requires a classical 3P approach, which is uh, plant designed well, processes maintained well, and there are people to take care of it. 
So the risk-based management system, which is followed by us, it has 15 components. So again, it starts from leadership, which is committed for safe practices. Uh, the activities are planned well, risks are evaluated, evaluated in hand, 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 hand have competent, competent human resources. resources. We have taken care of all the assurances, risk control measures are taken, all possible uh, preparedness for emergency has been taken. And if there is an event, we take learnings from them and which is uh, incorporated for all future, future design, design works, works risk, risk is continuously, continuously monitored. monitored. So this is, so this an, is ongoing an ongoing process. process. We, have, we, have we have to keep, keep updating, updating ourselves, ourselves processes, processes and, the and the people to ensure safe practices. If a disaster takes place, then uh, we have emergency response systems in place. For example, we have documented plans for emergency and disaster management. Then for offshore incidents, uh, there is a committee uh, which is called Offshore Security Coordination Committee. It is headed by Diesel, DG Coast Guard. And under this is a regional contingency committee, which comprises of 17 institutions. So which can cater to any emergency in the offshore. Similarly, for, for onshore, onshore, we have district level committees. Then in ONGC, we have our own crisis management teams to take care of any uh, emergency. For preparedness, we carry out regular drills. These regular drills are carried out for every installation based on the emergency response plan for each and every installation. We also carry out uh, drills on disaster management plans in collaboration with the district administration. We have fire and gas detection devices, which is a mandatory requirement for any plant. We have, uh, we maintain life-saving equipment, firefighting facilities, and we also have for offshore VATMS, which is the air traffic management system. So the hierarchy for the emergency response is like this. To start with, every installation has got an emergency response plan. Then at district level or regional level, we have regional contingency plan. Then from corporate, we have our own corporate disaster management plan. Then uh, Ministry of Petroleum has a CMP and on the top, it's a government, at the government level, there is a national crisis management committee. If there is an oil spill, uh, we have membership of OSRL. Uh, we have our own, uh, we have capability to deal with smaller oil spills up to 700 metric ton. If uh, the oil spill increases a little bit more, then we cooperate with our fellow partners and Coast Guard to take care of it. And if the oil spill is even bigger, then uh, we can call upon the help of OSRL UK. Uh, we have our own crisis management team. These teams are stationed in various places in all the four regions. So they are uh, skilled, qualified, and well-trained to cater to any eventuality. Uh, the picture uh, which we which is which here is, is, here is uh, a picture of our Narsapur uh, facility. Uh, fire prevention is being shown here. The cap assembly was positioned by the crane near the gas column. In slowness, it inched closer to the gap. Lines from the cap assembly were connected. The cap assembly was positioned by the crane near the gas column. The cap was instantly lowered onto the well mount. Men and machines holding it in place in triumphant conquest to keep it from being blown. The cap assembly was positioned by the crane near the gas column. In slowness, it inched closer to the gas. Lines from the cap assembly were connected to the dozers at strategic points. 
Inside, the cap assembly was positioned by the crane near the gas column. In slowness, it inched closer. This is, this is a picture of a blowout blow lines from the cap of assembly were connected back. to the building. And, and, uh, and, uh, this is a this is dated, dated picture. Dated picture. And Inside the gas column, this the incident. cap was instantly and how was on well, the well was cap, cap. Men and machines by, by a good blow blow it went on the top of the conquest to keep it from being blown up by the gas surging within. The choke lines were open to divert the gas कौन सा कौन सा and this is the water waters more than one thousand five hundred square meters. And how, and how this was well 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 kept? So this is so the subsurface sub sub image from the sea bed. And at this depth, the well, the well, was, well was kept. So this was so this done, was done with the help of a remote operated vehicle. The POP was stalled, and uh, this blowout was averted. So these are some of the examples. Uh, we also have a stall here. ONGC has a stall. So we can, if you are interested, then uh, more detailed discussions can take place there. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sharma. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, with that, before concluding the session, if, if we have maybe one or two questions with the permission of the days. Okay, so maybe just one question, sir. I am Colonel Sanjay Shivasta. I am Chairman of the Climate Resilient Observing System Promotion Council, a disaster management practitioner. We had the 7th February incident, sir, and in the backdrop of Chamoli's 7th February incident, we know the challenges of the forecasting, especially GLOF, LLOF, and the flash flooding which takes place. One of the challenge which we have observed, despite scientific evaluation of so much of knowledge and information, the community needs to be passed on this in their language, how to, you know, save themselves. So what are the initiatives in sensitizing the community in these vulnerable zones? This is my question. Uh, yeah. Uh Though mostly we, we do look after uh, armed forces, but yes, all the villages in and around and the community which are there, uh, or the labs which are uh, there in the Himalayas, all three of them, uh, and including uh, um, the new designated uh, DZRE, which was earlier named as ISA, they do go uh, to these uh, uh, villages and have the engagement with the community. Um, but generally in the in the what is our uh, what we have seen is uh, those community they are staying in, in slightly in a, in a better place whereas the armed forces they have to uh, go to the sites and go to the forward area where many things are uh, uh, not known whereas in these base areas mostly with the census it, it is it is known but yes few incidences do happen and uh, community approach, I, I agree with you that it should be increased. Uh, but that is what uh, it is again uh, based on the state government uh, taking the expertise of the DRDO and others who are there in the field to 
take it but we do proactively also engage the community thank you thank you for your response sir we would have loved to hear some more questions but unfortunately we are running behind time so let's quickly wrap up the session meanwhile uh, we present mementos to the esteemed speakers as a token of our appreciation and thanks we'd like to thank dr uk singh to present a memento to him may i invite on stage dr muzaffar ahmed former member ndma So ladies and gentlemen on behalf of WCDM it's a, it's our privilege and pleasure to present a certificate to the esteemed speaker as well as a memento and these certificates are for everybody whether you're a delegate or a speaker We thank you on behalf of WCDM, sir. Thank you for being a part of this session. And now to present a memento to our esteemed speaker, Sri Anurag Sharma, I have the pleasure of asking Dr. Ananda Babu, convener and president WCDM, to please do us the honors. Thank you, Mr. Sharma. Thank you, Dr. Babu. That wraps us up for the first session of this morning. But as you all know that we are behind time, so we would request you to quickly come back after the networking tea break. We shall reassemble and try to restart the next session. I know we don't have synchronized watches, but please do try and come back to start the next session at 12.10, positively by 12.10. Thank you so much.